Hey, Michael. I'm I'm Peter. So this is a, this is more of a trivia question than a uh, talk. Um, sh it should be super easy since you're all huge hockey fans. Oh, that makes it a little, a little bit harder. Uh, so also have a prize to encourage uh, pe people to guess. You get a, a free shirt, which Sean is is demonstrating one one of. Um, so just as a as a raise of hands, uh, which one of these four graphs do you think is a chart of last year's Western Conference standings? Who, who, who thinks it's A? Anyone? No? No one for A. How about an chart? Chart 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 one. Chart chart one? A few people. Two two people? Alright, uh, chart two? Is there anything that's chart two? Alright, more, more. Chart two. About chart three. A lot of people for chart three. Alright. And how about chart four? A lot of people for chart four. Okay. So the way I made these charts um, is that I wrote some Python code uh, to simulate uh, a random season where every team uh, is average. So the home team has 55% chance of winning every, every game. Uh, so chart two was the first run of that simulation. Chart three is the second run I got. And chart four is basically the, the average output if, if you were to run that 100,000 times. Um, so as you can see, on average, with all teams being average teams, the chance start will be one team that gets at least 105 points. Um, so th the point of this is basically hockey is all luck, uh, and we're, we're, uh, we're hopeless. Uh, but chart, chart one was the correct answer, so that's, uh, so congratulations. All right, and that's the luck. I know a little bit about is the media. Um, but I think the amount of information that is available in hockey analytics is fantastic. Um, you know, but, but part of it is you have to see the you know, you, you have to go to uh, evolving hockey. You have to go to natural stats right, to get it. And that's fine for the people who want to do it. But if you want to do that, it's like it's like going to see a band in a small club. You know, like you, you have to be the the one who puts in the extra effort because it's not getting pushed to you. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> so that's one reason that we need to protect uh, natural stat trick and, and evolving uh, hockey for as long as possible because, um, as we know, these sites go down and then you have to start all over again. Um, so this is why, you know, I say mainstream media can do a much better job pushing uh, hockey analytics. Um, you know, like I, I do write some writing for the athletic, and I find it bizarre that basically every other media outlet has sort of ceded the space um, to people in the athletic. Like there are really good uh, analytics articles in the athletic that I don't think you find uh, anywhere else. Like you can read your standard game recap all, all over, uh, or you can read what Allison uh, Luca is writing about the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, and you'd be infinitely more informed. You know, that's your choice. Um, and so, as I sit here and say media should be this great resource for pushing the information, um, you know, I, I built, built a bit of a cottage industry uh, for years going to the Sloan Conference. Uh, I would go there and complain about how NHL teams were slow to um, embrace new stats. And, um, and, and because teams were slow to do it, media was too. Uh, and that's why when, when NHL teams started to, uh, to hire more, more analysts, uh, like in 2014, you know, all of a sudden there was a bit more of a push from the media side, uh, and that's when I thought, you know, maybe, maybe we, we were on the right track. Um, but as I sit here in 2019, I'm not sure we're any further ahead. Um, I guess like, when I look at, say, the national broadcasters, I'd say Mike Johnson is one guy who 
who incorporates uh, analytics into his analysis and does it pretty smoothly, but he might be the only one. Like, if you go to, say, baseball, um, I think of a guy like David Cohn. You know, that's an ex-player who is, you know, up to date on the latest uh, advances in analytics, and, and he incorporates it into his analysis, like, day after day after day. And, and there just aren't people doing that in hockey analytics right now. Uh, and, it, and it's important to do because the loudest voices in, in hockey are they're either anti-analytics or, or they abandon it kind of the, the, the moment that it um, you know contradicts their, their worldview. So um, you know this is my uh, I guess my rage against the media is that they, they need more people to, to uh, push analytics and, and kind of drive that kind of coverage. Because um, I, I say this. I, I'm around rinks quite a bit these days. My, my daughter plays a lot of hockey, and, and when you talk to other parents, like they don't view a game through the lens of, of course, and zone entries. Like this is a, a, a small group of people who are really into that kind of information and understand it, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so you know, to me, the state of hockey analytics is that the data is great. I mean, it's imperfect. We all know how that it's imperfect, but it's great. Um, but it needs more of a platform. Uh, and the thing is, in the history of sports, statistics have been used as a basis of arguments constantly. Um, I just don't, <laughs> we haven't reached the point where we just say, why don't we just use better statistics? Um, and so my experience is that the younger audience seems to be more accepting, and, and I could just say, well, we'll just wait, wait it out, and then the younger audience will, uh, will drive that. Um, so maybe it is a matter of time, but it's taken a long time already from my perspective. You know, when you see how quickly basketball adopted analytics, uh, I can't help but feel like, you know, sometimes we're being left behind. And I'm, and I'm not happy, you know. <laughs> so, I, so uh, I'm probably the least name recognition of anybody who's going to give one of these speed talks, so I might do a little bit of an intro. Uh, I'm Shane, Ke Shane Kelly, I'm in-house counsel and one of the product managers at SNT, uh, who are famous for hits, which we just spent quite a bit of time dissecting. And we're also, I don't know if we partner with the NHL or the NHL partners with us, but we will be the official uh, tracking partner in the NHL starting in the playoffs, so we're really excited uh, for that. So hopefully this is a little more uplifting than Scott's talk. Uh, I'll say off the bat that I, I hope that with the new data, and certainly it's everybody's intent, that you'll see a lot more of it on broadcast and you'll be able to engage a lot more with it. So uh, we've also seen a lot of interest from the broadcasters in it. And you know, who knows if that falls through, but I think certainly everybody is, is hopeful on that front. So I'll cross my fingers for you. Uh, so the thing that I'm going to focus on when I was asked you know, to give something a talk about something to do with this data, I figured, well, I might as well focus on something we're going to be looking at a lot with the fucking player tracking data whenever we get it. And I kind of cheated, uh, so I went and looked at other sports that have done something similar recently, and we're, we're lucky in hockey in that basketball and soccer have undergone revolutions of this kind in the last few years, so it's, you know, it's a lot easier for us to sit here and go, okay, well, what did they focus on? And I think one of the big things that's going to come out with this data is going to be context. I think as an industry, we're really good now at the on-puck events, we like to call them. So like a shot, you know, we talk a lot in the expected goals model about shots, about zone entries, things like that. But whether it be the public data or, you know, what sport logic can do a great job, the guys back up there or staff is doing, we don't really know a lot about what's going on around those people when they do these things. I mean, saw Asma's, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, talk earlier and she was, you know, discussing how it's always better to enter the zone with the putt. But there are times, and we just don't know what's going on around these guys, where it's, you know, probably better for them to dump it in if it's one on five, for example. So we get a lot more of that type of stuff. Uh, the other, I think, really interesting area that is going to enlighten us a lot is defense. So, you know, when I was looking at research that other people had done in especially basketball, what you find is that when you can restrict space, it's a lot harder for anybody to create opportunity. 
And what this data is going to tell us really early and really accurately is how well people are able to restrict space. And while it's absolutely true that a lot of defense is the fact of trying to measure what didn't happen, we can kind of use that space as a proxy for measuring that. So if you gap up really, really well, and maybe we figure out that gapping up even tighter, to your point about zone entries, is, is better, then all of a sudden, while we don't know exactly what didn't happen, we have a much better way of measuring a defender's ability to restrict space. And the same can be said for you know, a four check. We might see that, well, a 2 2 1 might make sense in some scenarios. Maybe we see you know, a defender playing as a forward in, in some circumstances coming out of this data. And the other thing I think it's really going to help, and the twins and others have talked about, is expected goals metrics. We've got a lot of really good stuff in the public and private uh, side on that. And you know, this is the kind of data that's going to absolutely revolutionize uh, the work they're doing if they have access to it. Uh, but either way, you know, generally as a sport, it's going to absolutely change that because we're going to know so much more about what's going on. We're going to know if there is a pass, where the goalie was, et cetera. So you know, look for those type of things to be done early, I think, by teams and analysts who are smart with, uh, with what they do with the data. Sorry, one question. Who is we? <laughs> you just uh, said we? We're, we're going to know these things. Pardon? You just said we are going to know these things. I just mean we as a community. The whole community? <laughs> oh, 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 you're talking about what are you, in what context? Like, are we going to get results? Oh, I, I have no idea. I'm speaking as a sport that's, that is going to have access to the data. Okay. I mean, much like any other sport, that's up to the people who control it. I wish I could give you that answer. That's, uh, that's way above my pay grade. Sean. This is a speed talk also, and I think that, that about does my thoughts. So. <laughs> Hello, my name is Allison Lucan. I'm a writer for The Athletic. Um, I do what I like to call data-driven storytelling, so we're going to talk about that if I can find the mouse. And this is also a lesson in when Shuckers asks you to do something, don't just say, yes, that sounds great, and then have to put together a five-minute speed talk. Uh, so basically, I always start with this. Some people have seen this from me before. Uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons. What we say, what the dog hears. And in my experience, this is a battle that we're facing in the world of analytics right now. We are using terms that people maybe don't know, we're using concepts that are new, maybe not understood. They can sound scary, like a word like Corsi just sounds aggressive, right? And then you've got Fenwick, which isn't related to that. And then you've got expected goals, but you don't say expected goals, you say XG. And then sometimes you put a slash 60 after it, and you're like, what the heck is going on? So, basically what's going on is that we're living in a world right now that we have a ton of data, of models, of concepts, of theories, of systems work, coming into our world analytically. And it's about to get even more, as we just heard, with it hopefully public influx of subtracting data. And so my challenge to the analytics community, community in terms of what we need to do is we really, really, really need to focus on how we communicate this data. And to do that, what we need to do is very, very thoughtfully start to apply some intentional filters when we talk about information. So when we are looking at what we want to talk about, it is incumbent upon us to understand context, right? We need to know what XG means. We need to know how to explain it in layman's terms and when it's applicable to use. We can't just start, I like to call this the Cody CC problem. If you follow the Twitter debate, is it good or bad? Like pick a stat that makes it look good and apparently that's the stat that matters, right? So um, we need to understand context. Similarly, we need to understand application. Much like the Cody CC problem, I call this the top of the list error. You look at a number, players at the top of the list, boy, he's great, right? We have to know when it's valuable to apply a statistic to a situation, to a player, to a team. I have people all the time in my Twitter mention say, so-and-so is the best offensive player on the team. Why? What are you looking at? Like, that's not even a thing. 
That's probably a combination of things. Let's talk that through. Similarly, we are must, must, must understand the pros and cons of the data we're using. We just heard from the twins and from Brad about the issue with the tracking data. It was so scary to me to see people throwing around XG data when we knew it was wrong and not filtering it out, right? So we must know the risks we're taking when we use data, particularly newer data or flawed data. And finally, we must know our audience. I do not walk up to John Tortorella and say, John, your expected goal total is quite high this game. How do you feel the team play? That's not how that goes. So it's really, really important to understand that you're talking to a coach versus a player versus a fan I mean, we heard from the podcast recording today, what excellent discourse on, as a player, why does this matter? A player doesn't care about Corsi. A player appreciates feedback like we heard from Ryan saying, think of this dot line, this line that runs down the sides of the ice, and here's how I want you to execute entries against that. Right? So we need to think about explaining things in the language of our audience, not in our language, because not everyone understands that. So finally, why is this all important? Because these numbers are great, but particularly in what I do, if someone can't understand what I'm talking about, I've, I've done nothing to increase the value of their day. We want people to make font sizes proper so that they fit in the box. <laughs> uh, we want people to be able to comprehend things. Um, that's one of my biggest goals, is to hopefully have people coming away learning just one thing that they didn't know before. We also want people to be able to evaluate properly. That's part of how I got into analytics. I said shots on goal is a ridiculous stat to measure goalie performance, team performance, we need more. So we want people to be evaluated properly, and that's why this matters. And similarly, if we're talking about coaches, teams, we want them to be able to apply it. And finally, be able to improve. So when we talk about analytics, we know there can always be more data, always be more measures. But first and foremost, we must focus on communication. So, hello everyone, once again, those who listen to me, suffer from a tutorial. Yesterday, so I'm also a chess player, a chess master, so I carry that shackle of chess and a lot of things that I do. And chess is the oldest sport that has analytics. The first chess book was published in 1497. But I want to take you, as also a person that has proficient chess history, to take a route how chess analytics evolved through past 150 years and how the, what as I see how the pocket analysis goal compared to this and what prompted me for this slide is some replica uh, some uh, statement on Twitter is that the dumping is the worst play in hockey and such dogmatic statement was popular in chess at some stage and I'll get there how we produce this slide so, 150 years ago, people didn't bother with a lot of analysis in chess. People said it work, where it was more skilled would win. But in 1895, there appeared a school of chess analytics that said, okay, there are metrics, strict metrics, that can, just by looking at the board and saying, okay, where the pieces are, and who has more space, we can decide whose game is preferable, which side has more chances to win. And this school was had at the time great success. And about 30 years later, in 1925, another school came up and said, well, the metrics approach is correct, but the metrics that were used were wrong. We need to use different metrics. We, used to, we need to see how <coughs> we affect from outside and the principles in general, are right, but the inputs were wrong. And around 1955, it was particularly the rise of the Soviet uh, chess uh, that dominated the world for many years, the paradigm shift 
They say metrics are only guidelines. We need to look at particular, concrete, specific analysis of every situation that should support the guidelines of the metrics. And this kind of thought evolved into something that in 1985 in the metrics are not really important. It's the, only the deep particular analysis what is important and the games will start to get decided around by novelty around move training or by the fact that the player would forget what was the correct move in the analysis at move 25 or that the players would just play out the perfect pass to the move 30, 35 and the game would be end in a draw and so the chess, chess actually became so boring around, I don't know, year 2000 or something that led by the current world champion in 2015 we saw a completion of part of just chess again, the players would just step away from the main lines by third, fourth, fifth move and just play again only, and once again, just let the, the skill decide so I wonder, I, as I see from this conference and from what I hear uh, on Twitter, we're somewhere between 1925 and 1955 right now. Like the analysis of power plays and the penalties of particular developments are taking place, but not yet <coughs> that deep. But at the end, I wonder if after everything is calculated, okay, and for every situation, for every recipe of play, there is an antidote, and for antidote, another antidote, and this poker continues all over. Then the coaches would say, okay, no system anymore, go play again, just the game of all. Thank you. Um, I'm Tyrell Stokes, I'm a PhD student at McGill University, and I'm going to try to take a long view on uh, where we are in hockey analytics. And I want to talk about people doing hockey a a analytics and statistics in the context, I guess, of academia as being the latest in a long line of people that are essentially having to prove that the work that they do is serious and difficult and respectable. So naturally, like all hockey analytics talks, um, I'm going to start in the 17th century. So what's going on in the 17th century? Um, the modern scientific revolution, advent of calculus, it was also a heyday for an idea called determinism. So what's determinism? It's this idea that everything that happens, everything we observe, is coming from these um, immutable, universal laws. And why was this such a popular idea at the time? Well, partly because um, we had these new tools of calculus which were allowing us to literally look into the stars and write down beautiful equations describing the movements of, of the heavens. We were able to take invisible forces like gravity and write them down and predict how objects move through space and time. Um, so what was going on with probability and statistics? Um, a quote that I'm going to probably paraphrase and butcher from David Hume, the natural philosopher. Uh, what the vulgar call chances is nothing but a series of hidden causes. Um, there's a lot going on in that quote. First, vulgar, what did he mean by vulgar? He quite literally meant um, like seedy, people at the margins of society. People that were studying probability and chances in the 17th century were largely gamblers that were interested in you know, permutations of dice and, and cards and so forth. And the second bit uh, about the hidden causes was that this whole notion of chances seems to obscure what good science was in the day. Um, the whole, what a good scientist did was try to unravel the causes of uh, these universal laws. Um, and the whole notion of chances seems to obscure that. In the 17th and 18th century, bureaucracies started collecting reams and reams of data, and they started making these uh, tables, essentially. Uh, we were obsessed with causes of death at the time. And one thing that you can... Um, if you look at it, if you collect data at a large enough scales, for example, the city of London, for example, and you just you record um, all the ways in which people die, you start noticing that there's these really strange patterns that emerge. Year over year, the tables, the tables look eerily similar. And that's almost like there's some kind of laws of chances which are determining um, what those tables look like. 
Um, and so right around this time, fancy, respectable people started writing letters to each other about interesting problems that they found in gambling, or trying to figure out what was going on with these new government statistics. Um, and by the like, late 19th century, early 20th century, probability was to create, you know, respectable. Probability theory was, you know, respectable, basically part of mathematics. Um, and then somewhere around 1920, a very bad but smart man named Ronald Fisher said, hey, there's actually this thing called hypothesis testing, and it's also very hard and serious, but it's not quite math and it's not quite probability. And they said, fine, mathematical statistics is allowed. And then in 1950s, John Tukey said, statistics should be about data. And um, essentially exploratory data analysis is also hard and difficult. And they said, fine, applied statistics is allowed to exist, but now your seriousness is determined by what kind of questions you answer. It should be life or death, it should be medicine, it should be finance, it should be the economy. And right around now, in this next wave, um, people started doing things like hockey statistics, but you had to be sneaky about it. So for example, I have a grant where I essentially do hockey statistics and part of my PhD, but the way I have to justify that is I say, well, it's actually about public health, I study injuries. And it just happens that the best way to study injuries, the best data, it just happens to be professional athletes because I can track them, I know where they are, I know all these things about them. Um, and what I want to say end with is I think we're in this new age of, of data analytics where people are saying there's this thing that is not quite applied statistics. Um, it also has to do with data engineering. It also has to do with uh, questions of organizing data, framing data. Um, it's related to decision making, but it's not exactly decision theory. And historically speaking, this is when the really interesting things start happening. Um, and also we're in this place where data sets are so big and interesting in of them, on themselves, they sort of are justifying their seriousness. So with tracking data, it's going to become easier and easier to convince people essentially to let you study uh, within academics, I think, uh, these like uh, problems of sport. Um, and then I guess I'm going to close with, I guess, a warning to ourselves. So in that um, this should be the interesting time for hockey analytics and statistics within and without the academy. But also, if history is teaching us anything, it means that in about 30 years, there's going to be people that start doing work that we're going to say, that's not hockey analytics, that's not hockey statistics. And we need to ask them, what is it that they're valuing that we're not currently? So in about 30 years time, we're going to have to, there's probably going to be something new that's bringing, valuing some new sort of edge of uh, statistics and analytics. Thank you. Hi again. You get more of me. I'm here to tell you why the Carolina Hurricanes actually suck. No, no. Uh, I don't know. Um, so, uh, the year is 2018, right? Um, I'm having a particularly well lubricated evening, uh, looking to bring other people down with me, so I choose uh, the best victim I thought I could think of is the team that the rest of the community that I love uh, loves. So I decided to go at the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, and it wasn't exclusively motivated uh, just by spite. Uh, it was also because there was, I thought I had numbers to back up what I was thinking, right? Uh, the last time they made the playoffs was 2009. Uh, they were at NHL 500 around at the time of this tweet. They had about an even goal uh, differential, but they had 58.3 expected goal percentage. Uh, the second best team in the NHL at the time was 55.5, so way out in a, you know, in a league of their own in expected goals. Um, but they were underachieving that, which wasn't particularly unsurprising for them because uh, if you take the four-year span up until this point, December uh, 31st, they had underachieved their goal differential, uh, they had underachieved their expected goal differential by 0.61 goals, uh, per, uh, goals per 60. Uh, the second worst team, worst meeting underachieving, was at just uh, 0.2. So they were about three standard deviations below the second most underachieving team. So they were very special uh, in, in this context with regards to how uh, much they were underachieving. So I, I'm, in my head, something must be going on other than what we're seeing publicly here, expected goals models, 
uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and this team didn't seem particularly different as if you're just looking at uh, DPDO, in other words, uh, the PDO motivated by their uh, expected goals. They were around what they had been in the past. And, uh, well, long story short, the rest of the season they were top five in expected in save percentage and league average in shooting percentage and went out to the Eastern Conference semifinal, the uh, Eastern Conference final, so you can see that was, uh, I was bang on with that prediction, <laughs> right? Um, so the reason I wanted to bring up this tweet was because of two things. And the first one is about the difference between the private and public data in this new era where we're going to have a lot of data coming in. What is that going to do to the public sphere? And, um, because this, we, you know, uh, maybe I missed some things that the, the Hurricanes had behind the scenes. We know they're a very analytically driven team. Perhaps I was missing something. Uh, but if you look across the other major sports, most of them have had a moment something like this. Right? In basketball, you do have the second spectrum stats. Uh, if you go to NBA.com, they have a lot of great stuff. But you still have a lot of stuff uh, done in the public sphere, and basketball reference is still uh, a, a, a extremely valuable resource for uh, the casual analytical basketball fan. Uh, in football, they uh, just started to institute their uh, next-gen metrics, which includes things like completion percentage over expectation. Uh, but you can use that in conjunction with something like expected points added, which is a, uh, which is a statistic that is publicly uh, done, which is through NFL Scraper. Uh, and even in baseball, you can still get stuff uh, you know, from fan graphs or from the MLB website. So, yeah, there's going to be a whole new uh, influx of data, but that doesn't necessarily mean that what we've done up until this point is going to be obsolete. And furthermore, there's a legacy to these metrics. We're not going to be going back and uh, doing all of this player and puck tracking for previous seasons, so the perspective is going to take a while to kick in, right? We have now, going back to 2007, some really great data, a really long amount of things to base some of these conclusions off of for what's happening in the public sphere, and uh, that's still going to be absolutely invaluable. Uh, the second thing that I want to mention about this week is that uh, this isn't really mostly because the Hurricanes had other metrics. Mostly it was because I was wrong, right? Um, and the reason that I was wrong in this particular case, well, happened to be because I didn't uh, actually focus in enough on the difference between the two parts of PDO shot percentage and save percentage. Uh, their goalies changed, which improved their save percentage, but their shot percentage was way lower, and that was going to, so that one part was doomed to improve, right? Uh, this was pointed out to me from, uh, I'm not going to mention any names specifically, Eric Tulski, but it was pointed out to me by someone uh, in the, you know, in the actual organization about what exactly I goofed up. Um, so, and the, the second part that I wanted to point out about this was to not be afraid to be wrong, and Furthermore, about how great this community has been, right? I got started this probably about two years ago, and this is already the second conference that I'm uh, a, a part of, and that has next to nothing to do, in my opinion, with uh, the work that I've done. That has everything to do with how open the community is to letting people in. Uh, within the first biz that I made about uh, zone entries and stuff, I had Ryan Stinson, Alison Lucan, uh, uh, Prashant. All these people were uh, retweeting my stuff, uh, that, uh, and, and that really got me to make a lot of contacts and allow, uh, uh, allow me to keep contributing in the way that I have. And all these people have given me really great feedback, which has made an aging curve piece uh, that a uh, bunch of people have told me what I may or may not have done wrong. I think some of them might be here. Um, and, but they do it in a really productive way, right? And the reason that that's important is because we're going to need to keep doing this, right, as a community. Uh, we're always going to need to have this place for public uh, discourse, right? Even, even just today, we, we heard uh, Sean talk about how Money Puck has a ton of data that we haven't looked at yet, right? That there's still a lot to do left in that, right? So it's not just the new piece of information. It's also the stuff that we already have. So with that, you should you know, reach out to the community. It's really open. Uh, you should try things, not be afraid. Uh, try things, uh, even if you think you might not be great at it. And last but not least, you should be not afraid to be colossally and embarrassingly wrong. <laughs>